أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين For the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior and the Avenger, Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Askari, recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Whenever we gather to study the calamity of Ashura. And we have been blessed to do this year after year. But whenever we do this, we find ourselves completely baffled and confused. It is such a cosmic event, so great that it altered the course of history. And so we find ourselves as though we are only beginning to scratch the surface of the magnitude of Ashura. It's almost like we're still learning the alphabets, the very basics, the multitude of dimensions that this event has are unfathomable. From the fact that it's absolutely unique in every respect. It's not something, as we said last night, that's ever going to be repeated. It cannot be repeated in any of its different facets and dimensions. A lot of discussions have taken place. Countless books, articles, studies have been made. And yet, we are at a very preliminary stage, still trying to make sense of it. Its blessings, its significance in keeping the 
divine identity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants humans to be endowed with. The impact, the effects on every single dimension as we said. And so when it comes to the tragedy of Ashura, we have no choice but to continue down this path of exploration and learning. But even that is not enough. First of all, because a human lifespan is simply insufficient to try and encompass all of the teachings of Karbala. That's number one. Number two, there are ultimately things that fall outside the scope of our understanding, our capacity is deficient and limited. And so there are things about Ashura, there are lessons that the only means to acquiring them is to beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is to pray to God. Again, because our capacities are extremely limited. It's like an ant trying to encompass and completely and totally comprehend the contents of an ocean as the ant walks on the beach. It's simply impossible. But as we said, Imam al Hussein is such an incredibly powerful force that he allows things to be seen from a divine perspective. It's like someone who's blind and through cataract surgery or some other means, regains their eyesight. When they see the world for the first time, the clarity with which they're able to interact with things around them is astounding. Imam al Hussein gives us the eyesight that we need as people who are otherwise blind. Imam al Hussein shines a bright light on the different things that happen around us, which without him, they would make no sense, they would be confusing, they would be a source of doubt and misconception. The story of Imam al Hussein, the words of Imam al Hussein, the actions of Aba Abdullah, they give color to an otherwise black and white world, they give light to an otherwise dark world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this in the Holy Quran. When he says, Imagine you have an unfathomable ocean. At night, you see nothing. Imagine you're in that ocean. I used this example last night, but I want to use it from a different perspective now. Not as someone who's drowning. Let's imagine you're on an actual boat. You're not drowning. But at night, in the middle of the ocean, there is nothing to be seen. There's not even the light pollution that they talk about in big cities that somehow provides you know, light and allows you to see things even in the dark because you have different gradations of darkness, right? You have absolute darkness. Let's say you're in an enclosed space where there are no photons beaming in whatsoever. And then again, when you walk into your bedroom at night, there's a difference between the two, right? Because if you keep your eyes open long enough and if there is even a tiny window or something that allows a fraction of light to come in, you're able to detect certain things. You're able to see your way around. So the different gradations of light, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that and He provides an example of the kind of darkness that has no equal. أَوْ كَظُلُمَاتٍ فِي بَحْرٍ لجي. You're in the ocean and it's nighttime. Then Allah says, Yagshahu Mawjun. A wave, one of those giant 50, 60 meter waves approaches. Min fawqihi Mawjun. Then there is another wave that supersedes that, that is even bigger than that, that comes from up top. So you have an extra layer of darkness. مِنْ فَوْقِهِ سَحَابٌ Then there is a cloud that obstructs any kind of light being reflected by the moon or other stars. 
So it's nighttime, you have a wave on top of you, then there is another wave on top of that, then there is the clouds. You can see nothing. Allah says that if a person in that scenario extends their hands, they wouldn't be able to see their own hands. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن لَمْ يَجْعَلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ نُورًا فَمَا لَهُ مِن نور. Unless Allah provides you with light, you won't be able to see your way whatsoever. We have multiple ahadith that provides commentary and exegesis of this particular verse. And they say that this verse is about the time beginning with the death of Rasulullah. When the Holy Prophet passed from this world, that's when you began to have the various layers of darkness encompass the entire world. The first tyrant, then the second tyrant, then the third tyrant. And the Imam says, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَجْعَلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ نُورًا is the Imam. The Imam of the time of Rasulullah and the Imam of our time. Without this light, you won't be able to see a thing. فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ نُورٍ And as I said last night, we live in such a world, brothers and sisters, that decadence, immorality is ripe and completely ubiquitous. It's all around us. Not only that, but even in a world that claims to espouse values like freedom of expression and freedom of belief, you're not allowed to object. You're not allowed to. Because there might be laws that restrict your freedom of belief. And even if there are no laws to do that, there are other means to pressuring us into acquiescence and into acceptance, into submission to this new morality that's now replacing thousands of years of prophetic revelation. And this is by far the most oppressive and the most tyrannical means of suppressing belief. As Fir'aun stated in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes him. He said to the, uh, the, the people of Egypt at the time, his own subjects, he said to them, لا أريكم إلا ما أرى. وَلَا أَهْدِيكُمْ إِلَّا سَبِيلَ الرَّشَادِ I will only allow you to believe in what I tell you to believe in. And rest assured, I'm only going to guide you towards righteousness. Fir'aun used this narrative, which is that you don't need to worry about a thing. If your belief system contradicts with my version of morality, then your belief system is the one that's bigoted. Your belief system is what needs to be thrown out the window. I am guiding you to a new kind of morality. The kind of morality that is righteous and good. And so, we'll begin with your children. We will have them indoctrinated. And we will use every tool in the box. We will use laws. We will use the education system. We will use media. We will use social media. It's a jungle out there, brothers and sisters. And if you don't realize that, I'm sure you do. But if you don't realize that, then you are in a deep slumber. You don't know what's happening out there. The different techniques that are being employed in order to manipulate us, starting with our children, are absolutely demonic. And so, in a world like this, we need Hussein. We need the beacon of light that is Aba Abdullah al Hussein, that is Karbala, that is Ashura. In the famous ziyara that we recite, Imam al Sadiq teaches us to say this O oh Allah, Imam al Hussein paid the ultimate price. He gave the blood of his heart in your way for you. But the purpose was what? So as to guide your people, your creations, from ignorance and from the confusion of being lost. Imam al Hussein is like that lightning that happens in the pitch black darkness. But that moment, that single instant, is when everything lights up and you see things clearly.
You can identify your path. You know where you're headed. You know the pitfalls and obstacles that you're supposed to avoid. That is why, brothers and sisters, it is so critical that we connect ourselves, but more importantly, our children to Imam al Hussein. Let's not make this a seasonal event. I know that in the case of the vast, overwhelming majority of the brothers and sisters here in attendance and across the globe, Imam al Hussein is not just a seasonal event. Imam al Hussein is a remembrance that we carry with us throughout the year. Of course, Muharram is a prime season. Muharram is a time when it's all about Hussein and nothing else. But the rest of the year, it's critical that we connect our children, our families, ourselves with Imam al Hussein. Learn about him, explore his teachings, remember his tragedies, visit his shrine. Traditions tell us that for those who can afford it, they should travel and visit the shrine of Imam al Hussein at least twice a year. And for those who cannot afford it, to do so at least once a year. I said to somebody once, I said, have you been to Ziyara? And he said, no, unfortunately, I haven't been called. You know, that's a classic response that you get. Some means of pacifying ourselves and allowing us to sleep well at night is I've never been called. Well, you have been called. How many ahadith do you need from Rasulullah and Amirul Mu'mineen and Fatima to Zahra and the other members of the Holy Household that tell us to go and visit? I haven't been called? What's that supposed to mean? So he said, I haven't been there. I said, well, it's been 20 years since, since the fall of Saddam. I mean, how long do you need before you're able to make it happen? Before you're able to raise enough money or to borrow money? Imam Sadiq says that I guarantee the money that you spend in the way of visiting the shrine of Imam Al-Hussein, I guarantee it. So if you have to borrow, I'll make sure you pay it back. Imagine if a millionaire told you that I guarantee whatever money you have to spend on, the, on this trip. I'll make sure it's paid back. You have that backing, not from some millionaire who might potentially back out of the deal, but from Imam al-Sadiq. And yet you have people who have not been to Ziyara. The Imam himself says, I know I'm going on a bit of a tangent, but this is important. Our sixth Imam says, Ma ajfakum bil Hussein. How careless are you towards Abu Abdullah? Do you not care enough about him to visit him? And it's for your own good. It's not even, the Imam isn't benefiting from me walking into his courtyard, into his mausoleum. This is for me. Ma ajfakum. This is jafa, this is betrayal towards the haq, towards the right of Imam al Hussein upon everyone, as we said last night. And so. The Imams have told us to go. I said to this brother, why haven't you been? And he started making up all these excuses. Some of which might be legitimate. Again, I'm not judging anyone who's genuinely unable to go. But in this case, I said to him, if your father had passed away, wouldn't you try to put in the effort to visit his grave at least once a year? Just once every year to go to his burial site, recite Fatiha. Wouldn't you do that? I said, well, this is Aba Abdullah al Hussein. If I don't visit him at least once a year, then I've betrayed my ultimate father, Rasulullah, and Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ana wa Ali, Aba wa hadhi al-Ummah, the Prophet says. Me and Ali are the fathers of this nation. It's an act of betrayal, it's carelessness. It's misplaced priorities is what it is. That I would go on a vacation and I'd make sure that I'm entertained throughout the year, but when it comes to ziyara, all of a sudden, I don't care enough. And the fact is, as I said, visiting Imam al Hussein, engaging in his remembrance and sha'air and so forth, is for my own benefit. The more I connect with him, the more you solidify divine values in your children the more you allow them to connect to principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to abide by. And so we need this now more than ever, brothers and sisters, to recite the ziyara of Imam al Hussein, Ziyarat Ashura, by far the most important of the visitation and devotional texts of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, which 
If you're not in the habit of reciting it throughout the year, then at least try and maintain this habit throughout these two months, Muharram and Safar. Ziyarat Ashura, brothers and sisters, is so incredible. It has seven different chains of transmission. I don't have time to get into the authenticity of the, of the ziyarah. But seven different chains. Our most senior scholars have reported it, have mentioned it in their text. It is in fact hadithun qudsi. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam narrates it from his forefathers going all the way back to Jibra'il and after that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This incredible text, inside of which you find tawheed, unicity of Allah. You find nubuwa, prophethood. You find imama, divine leadership. You find adl. And you find qiyama, ma'ad. And you also find tawalli and tabarri. Allegiance to the righteous servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and disassociation and damnation from their enemies. You find it all in one text. It contains incredible prayers and du'as. It contains the most sublime form of worship, sujood. It contains asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with the best of the best on the day of judgment. Ziyarat Ashura is this kind of text. And so once again, is it a surprise when you read the narrations that speak of the rewards associated with Ziyarat Ashura? That Imam al-Baqir says that if you read it, obviously believing in the contents of the Ziyarat, Allah will give you the reward of all of his prophets and messengers. Again, I said this last night, the sad, tragic reality that we're dealing with is that you have people from within our community. If they were a bunch of Nasabis, we wouldn't be surprised. But from within the community, who try and cast doubt into these ahadith, these teachings, in clear defiance of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks about, in Surah Sad, He speaks about Sulaiman. And He says that Sulaiman was given superpowers, right? Warrih, he was able to manipulate the wind to his liking, to use the wind as a form of transport, transportation. I mean, imagine that. And he was given authority over demons who would carry out tasks for him. All these things. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هَذَا عَطَاؤُنَا فَمْنٌ أَوْ أَمْسِكْ بِغَيْرِ حساب. This is our remuneration. And it has no hisab, meaning that we can and do and will give as much as we want. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the universe, that we're talking about here. When Allah says that by reciting Ziyarat Ashura, you will be granted this kind of reward, don't be surprised. Because this ziyara and the contents of the ziyara and the teachings of this ziyara. And the fact that it connects you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fact that it reminds you of how it all makes sense. The saga of Imam al Hussein is inextricably linked to the greatest events in human history. It connects everything, it makes everything plausible. It all begins to make sense. How the fact that prophetic individuals and divine messengers were killed and hunted down and murdered and whatnot is not a means of uh, thinking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left this world to the whims of tyrants and despots and immoral human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the saga of Imam al Hussein, through texts like Ziyarat Ashura reminds us Ultimately, I and my messengers, my prophets, will verily, surely win victory as to, as to God. The ultimate victory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to this incredible verse. Allah says, Inna 
والذين آمنوا في الحياة الدنيا ويوم يقوم الأشهاد We surely will give victory to our prophets and the believers Not just the prophets, but also the believers في الحياة الدنيا, in this world as well as the day the witnesses shall rise on the day of judgment. What does this even mean? Imam al Hussein was killed. His family was massacred. Prophets and messengers were all murdered one after the other. What happened to the victory? Allah says victory will come. And even without considering the raja, the return of Imam al Hussein at the end of time, without talking about that pivotal moment in history, which is an absolute unmistakable fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not only send his final emissary, the imam of our time to restore justice, but that he will bring Imam al Hussein back to life in this world, even without considering that aspect and that belief that we have, who's the victor today? Is it Yazid or is it Hussein? Yazid, who was seated on his throne, drunk with power, victory, and alcohol, laughing and screaming and hysteria. That Yazid, was he the victor? Or is now Imam al Hussein the undisputed champion of the entire world? Is Imam al Hussein not someone that you would attribute victory to? Even now, even as he lies in his grave. Allah has given this promise. So once again, when you connect with the legend of Imam al Hussein and everything that is associated with Imam al Hussein, including the devotional text, the ziyarat, the pilgrimage, and all of these other things that, alhamdulillah, we are now so blessed to be able to do freely, at least in this country and many other countries around the world. When you do that, Imam al Hussein then gives you so much, even though, even though, remember this. There are two ways of speaking about Imam al Hussein. The most predominant, common way is to say, what do we get from Imam al Hussein? What do we get from the commemorations of Ashura? What do we gain from all of this, right? That's one thing, which is a valid series of questions. And it is important because it allows us to maximize the benefits. The other way is to flip this around and say, Ya Aba Abdullah, what can I do for you? Sa'sa Sa ibn Sawhan was a companion of Amir al Mu'mineen. When he fell to the ground and having fought with the enemies of the Imam in Jamal, the Imam came to him. Or rather it was Zayd ibn Sawhan, his brother. Amir al-Mu'mineen came to him. He said, may Allah bless you, O Zayd. Kunta kathir al-ma'una qalil al-ma'una. Let me try and open this up just a little bit. The Imam says to him, you were a big help but not someone who would burden me. You know how sometimes in a family you have different children. One of them could be extremely helpful towards his parents. He doesn't even wait for them to tell him what to do. He doesn't wait for instructions. Rather, he's always anticipating what his parents want from him. And he's always trying to be as helpful as possible around the house. Then you have somebody who's not exactly as helpful as his brother, right? And so, not only do they not provide help and assistance around the house, but they're causing trouble every once in a while. And so the parents are always worried about this person. They're always worried that they might get themselves into trouble. They're worried that they might have issues with the law, for instance. They, they worry that they might not pass their exams. You know what I'm talking about, right? Within the following, the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, within the Shia, you have these two kinds of people. 
Before I continue, my dear brothers and sisters, if I could just ask any of you who has any space in front of them, in front of them to come forward to make space for those joining us, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I know there isn't a lot of space, but if you can, if you can occupy any amount of space that you have in front of you, this might allow more people to join us, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. To receive the intercession of Fatima to Zahra, Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen, on the day of judgment, recite a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Within the community that comprises the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, you also have these two types, don't you? You have the one like Yours truly, who's always getting into trouble, who's always causing concern and anxiety for the Imam of his time. The Imam of his time is receiving reports of this person's actions twice a week. And in that report, all he sees is trouble. All he sees is transgressions and sins. And so the Imam out of his grace, out of his generosity, out of his love for his followers, would pray to Allah and ask him to forgive this individual. And so I'm only a source of trouble for the Imam. The intercession that I hope to receive from him is precisely to address this problem, right? Then again, you have the likes of Zayd ibn Sawha. You have the Salmans and Miqdads and Ammas. You have individuals who are at the Imam's beck and call. They're always ready to receive instructions from their Imam and carry them as soon as possible. They're proactively trying to serve the Imam. And the Imam speaks to Zayd and says that you are one of these individuals. Kunta kathir al ma'una. You always, you were ready to provide help. You were ready to assist me, to have my back. Qaleel al ma'una. And I didn't have to worry about you too much. Subhanallah. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to Imam al Hussein, as I said, one way is to say, how do I benefit from him? The other approach is to say, how do I serve him? I talked a little bit about this last night. I want to expand it just a little bit more tonight, inshallah. How do I serve Abu Abdullah? In serving the Imam, I stand to benefit in a way that is unfathomable. But you see the difference between the two perspectives. The two approaches. Instead of asking, well, how do we maximize the benefits of the day of Ashura? I say, how do I make Ashura a source of guidance for myself and other people? How do I please the Imam of my time? How do I please Aba Abdullah? In other words, I'm not even looking for rewards and thawab anymore. You see the difference? As the poet says, I'm not even seeking rewards. All the traditions, all the quotes we have from the Imams that speak about what one stands to receive in exchange for their tears and their lamentations are irrelevant. Because I am crying for you. Oh, Abba Abdullah, because you deserve it. I'm crying for you because I can't help not to. I cry spontaneously because I have anchored my boat to yours, because I've connected to you, because I've become so close to you. I cry and I don't have to provide an explanation for that. 
when a mother gr grieves for her child, does she have to provide an explanation? Does she ever say that I'm crying because it's rewarding, because I got thawab out of it? Or does she spontaneously and uncontrollably express her grief for her child? Right? When you get so close to someone, suddenly you empathize with them on every level. Imagine, imagine, God forbid, you have a son or a daughter who's in hospital because they're receiving medical treatment for a condition, right? And because of that condition, there's a food that's their favorite, but they're not allowed, medically speaking, they're not allowed to, to eat it. You will see that if that food was presented to you as a parent, you wouldn't eat it. Why? Because my boy is in hospital and he can't eat this. And he loves it so much. Am I right? What we're supposed to do, brothers and sisters, is to elevate our connection to Imam al Hussein to a point where we're that close with him, where we align our actions and our thoughts and our lives with his. And we empathize with him in such a manner where the tears simply flow out and stream down without me having to convince myself that doing so is a means of reward and thawab. And so the question that a true servant of Imam al Hussein, and inshallah, we can all be servants in some capacity or another. It doesn't matter how small and insignificant. It doesn't matter whether it's serving food or drinks or even lining up the shoes of those who attend the majlis of Imam al Hussein. It doesn't matter in any way, shape, or form. What matters is that we serve Imam al Hussein. Again, the question we should be asking ourselves is how do I serve you, Ya Aba Abdullah? A true servant of Imam al Hussein says, Mamnoonak, Ya Abu Ali. I am grateful to you. I am so thankful. Mamnoonak, that you allowed me to be in a position where I can be of service. Thank you for letting me participate in the remembrance of your family and your children when you walk from Najaf to Karbala during the Arba'in you see all of these buildings that have been erected for the service the mawakib as they call them some of these mawakib they go to extreme lengths in choosing a creative name that somehow reflects their values reflects the individual perhaps that they love or res respect or admire within the camp of Imam al Hussein, right? And there are over two dozen of them named Dam'at Ruqayya. The tears of Ruqayya. Not Ruqayya herself, not Imam al Hussein, but the tears of Ruqayya. If I can somehow be of service to the tears of Ruqayya, wouldn't I do that? If we were there in the ruins of Sham, wouldn't I give my life to try and comfort the three-year-old daughter of Aba Abdullah al Hussein? Wouldn't we do this? Mamnoonakya Abu Ali, that you let me take part in some capacity in your service in trying to help you and, re and revive your remembrance. This is how a khadim, how a servant of Aba Abdullah al Hussein thinks. Subhanallah. There was a man, I'll mention this story and then I'll wrap up because the musibah that we want to mention tonight is a truly heartbreaking one. The tragedy of Imam al Hussein leaving Medina, the city of his grandfather, the city of his mother Fatima al Zahra. But I want to mention this story. A man was a servant of Imam al Sadiq, but he wasn't the kind of servant who would for instance, cook for the imam or clean his house. He had one job, a very simple job. That job was to hold the reins to the mule that the imam would ride on and go to the masjid to teach and to preach and to pray. Imagine a mule that the imam rides on. He used to simply hold it while the imam was inside the masjid. One day, this man was standing outside, the imam was in the masjid, a group came from Khurasan, listen to me carefully. 
This group came from Khurasan. One of the members of this group looked at this man and he realized that this person is a servant of Imam al-Sadiq. So he said to him, how about we make a deal, you and I? He said, I'm a very wealthy man. I have a lot of money. How about you take all of my money? Look at the ma'rifah. Look at the gnosis he has of just how valuable this service is. He said, I have a lot of money. I'm a very wealthy person. How about I give you all of my wealth and you let me take your position? Simply holding the reins to the imam's mule. This young man had been with Imam al-Sadiq for a long time. He said, wait, let me go and speak to my imam and then come back and tell you my decision. He went inside. He saw the imam. He said to him, you have no Rasulullah. I've been with you for a long time. I've been doing, doing this very simple act. Now if some good fortune came my way, would you tell me to not take advantage of it? Or would you say, take advantage of it? Take it. The Imam said, why would I tell you not to take advantage? We give you whatever I can. And when somebody wants to bring you, the Imam knows what's happening. If somebody wanted to give you something good, I'm not going to stop you. So the young man says to the Imam, he said that, or perhaps he wasn't young, but as I said, this was his job. He said to the Imam, well, this is what happened to me. A wealthy merchant came, he told me that I am willing to give you my entire wealth in exchange for taking your position in serving Imam al-Sadiq by holding his mule. The Imam said to him, if you are not interested in being with us and serving us, that's okay. You can go and I'll accept the service of that man. Because again, that man was an individual who knew what he was doing. So the Imam says, I will accept his service and you can go on your way, it's okay. So the man walked away. The Imam then called him. He said, come back, he came. He said to him, look, because you've been with me for a long time, I have a duty, an obligation to give you my sincere advice. He said, what's that? He said, on the day of judgment, Rasulullah will be closest to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We the Imams, starting with Amir al-Mu'mineen, will be closest to Rasulullah. And we will be closest to Amir al-Mu'mineen and our followers and our servants and our Shia will be closest to us. And because I have to give you my advice, I should tell you that you will be compensated for what you do. In other words, don't sell too cheap. Don't do something that makes you lose out on this incredibly lucrative position that you have. You don't understand how important this is. You don't appreciate it. But you should know that this, is, this matters. So the man said to the imam, in that case, I will stay right here. For all we know, he might have been a very poor person as well. And imagine, somebody tells you that I'm going to give you several million dollars in exchange for holding the reins to a mule. Who would say no? But he captured the message of Imam al-Sadiq. He went straight outside. That man looked at him. He said, when you went in, you looked happy and delighted that perhaps you're finally going to get rich and uh, you, you won't be living a life of misery, but now you look different. You don't look so interested anymore. He said to him, yes, the Imam told me what I needed to hear. And so I won't exchange this position for anything in this entire world. As I said, a servant of Imam al-Husayn says, Thank you. You've allowed me to live for another year so that I could help in eulogizing your tragedy and honoring your name. Amir al muminin says that whoever mourns my son Hussein, فَإِنَّهُ مِنَّا وَإِلَيْنَا He's from us and he will come back to us. We will look after them. I'll mention this one last point and then go to the Masa'id. Ayatullah al-Uzma al-Na'ini, the teacher of 
of Sayyid al-Khoi and other prominent scholars. He's sent an istifta, they send him a letter. The letter is actually available online. You'll see an image of it. So the person asking the question speaks, uh, or rather asks about certain du'as and whether these du'as are helpful in certain circumstances when it comes to poverty, when it comes to ill health, when it comes to this, that, and the other. So he says to an naini are these du'as helpful? Or can we rely on the chain of transmission and so forth? So al mirza naini responds. He says, he gives him some criteria and instructions. Then he says to him, وَإِنِّي لَا أَرَى شَيْئًا أَفْضَلَ لِحَوَائِجِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَ مِنْ زِيَارَةِ عَشُورَ Having reached the peak of scholarship and knowledge, he says, I don't know of any other dua, any other text for the needs and wishes of both this world and the next like Ziyarat Ashura. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when you hear stories from our grandest of scholars like uh, Al Mirza Shirazi, for instance, Sayyid Abdul Hadi. Ashirazi and others who say that they saw in a dream the angel of death saying that I just came from extracting the soul of Mahallati who was a senior teacher in the Hausa. And so he says to him, how is he doing? He said, he's doing very, very well in fact. And he now has a thousand angels under his command. Imagine having a thousand angels who will do whatever you ask them to do. He said, well, why is that? Is it because of his teaching? Is it because of his books? Is it because of his prayers, fasting, this, that? He said, no, it's because he always recited Ziyarat Ashura. Don't be surprised. Anyway. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله May Allah make us among the genuine, sincere servants of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. People who don't sell their service to the Imam in exchange for fame, in exchange for money, in exchange for any worldly thing because they would lose out on all of those rewards for what? For something that's transient, for something that's only going to be around for a short while. The Imam says, Whoever uses the name of Imam al-Hussein to fill their stomachs and to consume things and to make money or fame or what have you, they will become poor. They won't benefit from any of it. May Allah make us sincere in the service to Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. The Imam sets out from Medina in the darkness of night. Bi'abi anta wa ummi ya Abu Abdullah. Kharaj al-Hussein. من المدينة خائفا يترقب. The family of Aba Abdullah al Hussein was terrified. Imagine the Imam coming to his women and children in the middle of the night, saying that we have to leave tonight. But of course, the Imam had to leave. And one of the main reasons for that is because Banu Umayya, may Allah's eternal damnations be upon them, were known to use the most treacherous methods when it came to pressuring their opponents. One of which was that they would take their women and children. They would take the women and children in order to force their opponents to do what they wanted. And so the Imam had to leave, he had no choice. The first thing, the he, first did thing he did was go to his grandfather's, to his grandfather's shrine. shrine. Assalamu as alayka ya jaddah ya rasul Allah. Peace be upon you, O grandfather. Dhummani indaka ya jaddah fi hadha al-gari. Allani ya jaddu min balwa zamani astari. My grandfather, grandfather Rasulullah, take, take me to me you. To I don't want I don't to come want back to, come to back this to world. The Imam fell asleep. In his dream, he saw Rasulullah. 
يستهم يا رسول الله أنا الحسين بن فاطمة You recognize me my grandfather I am the son of your beloved sweetheart Fatima Tuzahra فرخك وابن فرختك Take me to you I don't want to come back What does Rasulullah say to him فعلى من داخل الخبر بكاء وعوي ونداء بافتجاع يا حبيبي يا حس يا حبيبي يا حس يا حبيبي يا رسول الله سست أبا عبد الله يا حسين The future of my nation rests on your sacrifice Intercession on judgment day depends upon you يا حسين You can stay with me if you want But if you go you will make your mother happy Aba Abdullah al Hussein wakes up, he knows what to do. He then heads over to the Rawda, Ma Bayna Qabri, Wa Minbari Rawda, Tun Min Riyad al Jannah. He goes to the grave of his mother Fatima. Aba Abdullah has a lot of memories in Medina. He has a lot to say. But perhaps the most painful thing is, oh people, my mother was too young. He bids his mother farewell. He then goes, informs his brothers, his children, the men of Bani Hashim to get ready for the journey ahead. Al Abbas, of course, is the first to come. Al Abbas is the commander of Hussein's camp. He is the one man army of Abu Abdullah. Ali al Akbar rushes to join his father because Ali al Akbar is Hussein's special sacrifice on that day. Al Qasim and Abdullah ibn al Hassan they join their uncle because they want their father Imam al Hassan to be represented in the in the battle of Karbala. Everyone joins Imam al Hussein. Ruqayya comes to her father because Islam needs a beacon in Sham. But ya Aba Abdullah, why you're two weeks old infant, Abdullah al-Radhi? Remember Abdullah was only a couple of weeks old at that time, on the 28th of Rajab. Do you know why? Because this infant cannot live without his father. لا تدفن الطفل إلا عند والده فإنه لا يطيق اليتم في الصغر because Hussein when he is interred into his grave he wants the headless body of his infant placed on his own chest everyone joins Abu Abdullah Hussein. The caravan is now ready. The men of Bani Hashim have joined and answered the call of Abba Abdullah. Now it's the turn of the princess of Bani Hashim to join them. Lady Zainab had told her husband that wherever my brother goes, I join him. But before Zainab comes, They've made, They've the, made camels the camels and the carriages, and the carriages ready. ready. But for Zainab but for to Zainab come to out come of her out home, of her home the, youth the youth of Bani Hashim, Hashim create, a, create corridor a corridor so that so no that one no catches, one a, catches glimpse a glimpse of the daughter of Fatima. This is how Fatima left her home to the masjid. 
The hadith the says hadith that when Fatima al Zahra came, came out, no one, no one could one see her shadow. Fakharajat fi lummatin min hafadatiha, wa nisa'i qawmiha, tata'u duyulaha, ma takhrimu mishiyatuha, mishiyat rasulillah. So they create a corridor. Zainab leaves her home. She heads towards the carriage. As soon as Abbas sees her sister Zainab, he falls to the ground. He places one knee on the sand. The other knee is a step for Zainab to stand on and to enter into her carriage. Abbas is happy. Umm al must have been observing, observing this. this. Umm al rejoices. rejoices. Thank you, Thank my you son my Abbas. Son Abbas. This, is this is how I raised, how I raised you, you to look after look your, after sister, your Zainab. sister Zainab. But Abbas, but Abbas I've, also I've also raised, raised you, you such that such you don't that you come don't back come with back your brother, with your brother Abba, Abba Abdullah. Make sure, Make Abbas, sure Abbas, that as long that as, as long there is a heartbeat, a heartbeat in, you, in you, that you defend, that you defend Abba Abdullah. Zainab rode in her carriage. Yes, they were terrified. Yes, they were scared. But Zainab was treated with the honor and respect befitting the princess and the daughter of Fatima and Ali ibn Abi Talib. She had her brothers with her. She had her protectors with her. They head towards Karbala. Contrast this with the scene on the 11th of Muharram. Aywa waylah wa musibata. The enemy the came enemy and came said, and said we, will we will help you help on the back of back these of naked, naked camels. camels. Zainab, Zainab said, no, said one no one draw near, near us. us. We will take we will care take of the care children of and the children women. And we'll, the help we'll help them embark on their camels. On their camels. And so they and helped so they the women, the, women, the, children. the children. When they placed when Imam Zain al Abidin on his camel, camel. then they then chained they his neck his to his hands, hands and his two, and his legs, two legs from legs under from the under belly of the camel. The camel. Everyone was helped embark on the back of their camels until no one was left but Zaina. What does Zainab do? She looks around. She sees the companion slain on the plains of Karbala. Habib, weren't you the one who came to my tent and said, as long as I breathe, I won't let anyone near you? But Zainab cares, cares about, about one, person one person in particular. In particular. She looks she in the looks direction, the direction of, the river of the river of the Euphrates. Euphrates. Abbas, man, tell me. Abbas, you were the one who helped me on the back of my camel in Medina. Where are you today? Zainab doesn't Zainab want doesn't to embarrass want to her brother Abbas. Abbas. Instead, she, Instead heads she heads towards the killing the pit. pit. She, came she came to the body to of Abba, Abba Abdullah. Abdullah. She said to him, Akhi Abba Abdullah, Law khayyaruni bain al-maqam andak war-rahil by God. If they give me a choice to stay with you or to go, I would stay even if they cut me into pieces. Pieces. But what can what I do? Can Look, I at do? Look at Shimon and how he is pulling us. us. Then Zainab, then Zainab does Zainab one last, last thing. thing. Before she Before goes, she, goes, she, places, she places her lips, her lips on, the on the jugular vein of Abba Abdullah. Hussein! Hussein! 